God's presence, the angel of his presence, and Moshiach, man and divine beings. Rabbi Solo Jezaki, generally known today by the acronym Rashi, Rabbi Slomo Ishaki was a medieval French rabbi, and that's what this article said in Wikipedia that I uh, Googled and found, but uh, he actually was in the period of antiquity, which ends in 400 common era. He is often referred to as the first rabbi who believed that the Jewish people as one man or God's righteous servant. The early sages expected a personal messiah to fulfill the Isaiah prophecy. Chapter 53, chapter 11. Chapter 11, the descendant of David has the spirit of God alight upon him. And if you read Ezekiel, the key to Isaiah 53, the spirit enters him. No alternative interpretation was applied to this passage until this time. <clears throat> Rashi believed that the servant passages of Isaiah referred to the collective faith of the nation of Israel rather than a personal Messiah. Some rabbis, such as Ibn Ezra and Kimsky, agree. However, many other rabbinic sages, <clears throat> including Moses ben Maimon, commonly known as Maimonides, or Maimonides, and also referred to by the acronym Rambam, a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, realized the inconsistency of Rashi's views and would not abandon the original Messianic interpretations. I can add much to that. Rashi's commentary on Isaiah chapters 52, 13 to 15, which are the beginning of the description of God's righteous servant, leading into chapter 53. The Rashi's commentary conflicts with his commentary on the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, when he says, this is his leading to his commentary on Zechariah 1, the prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains visions resembling a dream that requires an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of its interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. The teacher of righteousness, that is the man of Isaiah 53. He's God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous with long life, and by his knowledge. The truth of the interpretation of the prophecy of Zechariah 1 begins with the creation of the angel of God's presence. God created all things, including spirit and souls, that together form persons. The first person he created was the person of his spirit, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. This can be found in Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, 9-10. In all their troubles, he was troubled. And the angel of his presence delivered them. In his love and pity, he himself redeemed them, raised them, and exalted them all the days of old. But they grieved his Holy Spirit. Then he became their enemy and himself made war against them. So it starts out the angel of his presence delivers them. And then would be in all their troubles the Jewish people. In his love and pity, capital H, God redeemed them raised them and exalted them all the days of old. It's the same thing. If you redeem them, you deliver them.
the Holy Spirit is great has to be a person. Judaism does not believe the Holy Spirit is a person. Okay. He can't be grieved if he's not. And there's plenty of other scripture to support the belief that indeed he is a person. He goes to Ezekiel at one point and says, Ezekiel, speak. He takes Ezekiel using a spirit on a vision. And I'm going to get to all that. The spirit of God does. And that's the angel of his presence. And it makes sense. Because God created an angel, and I'm going to go into that. And for its body, not human form with wings. His body is the spirit of God. So he's an angel, and he's a spirit. The angel of his presence, which makes sense. Wherever God's presence is, which is his mind, it's where he feels he is, as we do, where we go, our mind goes, and this is where we're at. And that is what goes into the temple of God, along with his spirit, his Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence, is the Shekinah. That, that Ezekiel sees in a vision enter the east gate for the, to, to, to enter the temple. All persons... All persons. The lightning, when God says, let us make God in our image, the spirit is hovering over the waters of the earth in creation. Okay, that's the person he's speaking to who does not respond. There's lots of reasons for that <clears throat> that I'm not going to go into right now because I'm going to get to Zechariah. The image is he is a being in existence with emotions. He has no form. He has no human body. He's never had a human body. He was never born again in the flesh or born in the flesh, as they say of Jesus. He is an entity to be feared. All persons... Our souls blended with spirit. Our soul is like our DNA, okay, for the spirit. It's, it's, it's the foundation of the person we are, along with our upbringing, of course. <clears throat> Environmental and genetic. So, all the different references in the Hebrew Bible to spirit versus soul, pretty much talking about a person. And that's... That's how to think of God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, the persons. But that's about, you know, but you can't liken them to human persons. They simply aren't. They can communicate with man as though they were human persons. In other words, make the human person comfortable while we communicate with him to accomplish our purposes that we want in our creation. They come first in everything. This is, this is theirs, this world. Humanity, it's all theirs. God, God, God says, I am my creation. And you won't find that in the Hebrew Bible. That's straight from me. And you'll see why by the time this is over. God takes this special soul and places it before his face and speaks the words, I am. But God does not use his voice. He becomes the person he is creating. I mean, he's still God. He's, uh, uh, I don't know the right word for it right now, emulating. He uses the childlike voice of an angelic person. He speaks to the angel as God and answers for him as the angel. The spirit, spirit is very complicated, is absorbing this as though, as though a mind in and of itself. And here's the interesting thing about spirit. You are not, 
Your thoughts are not your brain. Your thoughts are from the spirit that God placed within you at birth. Your brain takes in, through your eyes and your ears, information that is really nothing more than little synopsis, electricity, chemicals, special tissue in different parts of the brain. Spirit can read it. It read it and it becomes your thoughts. If not, there could not be an afterlife. There could not be a spiritual heaven because you don't have your mind. God has to supply the information for you just as he's doing with the creation of the angel of his presence. He is the information of your mind, which in the heaven that he is creating for the Jewish people with the name Israel shall endure, is information primarily based on being a Jew, Judaism, a Hebrew Bible, Town, Jewish history, Jewish culture, Jewish cooking, Jewish everything. That's the heaven he's making. He calls it Jerusalem. And he calls it something of the earth for antiquity and the Middle Ages. His book is written for them first and for us to reinterpret in the age of the common era, which includes the age of enlightenment, reason, knowledge, medicine, science, and today information, the internet, which began with computers in the late 1960s. God simulates being this new person for ages and ages until he is perfect as God would be, would have him be. Then God releases that soul and spirit from before his face with the breath of life. And the person of the spirit of the God was created. An angel whose body is the spirit of the holy God, the Holy Spirit. God is always in him. God was him. God can always place the person of the spirit before his face and be him. And speak as him and through him. And this is how God is in the angel that was sent to guard the Israelites on the way to the promised land. I am sending my angel. <laughs> Having a computer problem. I am sending my angel before you to guard you on the way and bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your offenses. Since my name, Hashem, my name, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. They're together. Imagine two clouds. Here's the elements of the unseen that are God's mind. Here, this cloud are the elements of the angel and the Holy Spirit of God. Two clouds, and they just come together. God remains one. He created this cloud. But they're together as one cloud. So when the Spirit of God enters a man, and I'm going to show this in Zechariah, it's the purpose that God had it written for me. And as Rashi says, we've got to wait on the teacher of righteousness for somebody to interpret this. Well, that's what this video is. The interpretation of Zechariah 1. But anyway, you have these two clouds. When the Spirit entered Ezekiel, he could hear God's voice. God's speaking to him, and he says, at that moment, the Spirit entered into me, and I could hear the words of God. That's what that's all about. And there's a lot more, and I'll get to that. Oh, Ezekiel says, And he said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet that I might speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. So this is God speaking to a man who is Ezekiel. But he does not hear God speaking until at the same moment 
a spirit enters into him and sets him upon his feet. The spirit of God entering man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him as he does Moshe. And God is in him. From chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah. A lights upon, the Spirit of God alights upon the twig that sprouts from the shoot of the stump of Jesse. The twig is Moshiach. The shoot is a descendant of King David through King Solomon, each of whom had Davidic uh, covenants with God for kingship and their line, excluding the kings of Judah that we have in the Hebrew Bible. That entire uh, ancestral tree cut down, and there's only a stump remaining. Jesse is the father of King David. Ezekiel says, The presence of the Lord ascended from the midst of the city, Jerusalem, and stood on the hill east of the city. A spirit carried me away and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God. Okay, he's got to be a person. To the exiled community in Chaldea, then the vision that I had seen left me, and I told the exiles, Assyrian Babylon exiles, from the northern kingdom and from the southern kingdom. All the things that the Lord had shown me. That the Lord had shown me. But it's the spirit of God that takes him on the vision. Again, standing on a hill or not, they're together. I don't know how that works. <laughs> but, but God is showing his oneness in that. That's what that story is about. He's showing his oneness. <coughs> he's showing he's separate and apart. From the Spirit, but that the Spirit is a person. He's the one that takes Ezekiel, who has a guide with him, a spirit. That's why, t with the Spirit, the Spirit of God takes Ezekiel on a vision. Because Zechariah, the same story, and that's why I'm giving you all this information. Same story there. He has a guide, an angel guide with him, and it's about the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is the angel of God's presence. The only power in heaven is God. Moses did not perform miracles in the Exodus. God did. The angel of death did not kill the firstborn of Egypt. God did. The power of God is his and his alone. He does not share it or create it in others. His power comes from his will. He thanks it. He speaks it. And it is. Just as with creation in Genesis. It is, it is a physical process. So he doesn't have a magic wand. Things happen in the unseen. Elements we can't understand. Our science is so different. His realm was there. He created all of the universe with the big bang as it is now. He created it all. As he says, I divided light and I divided darkness. If you take the platform of heaven, and this is just this is just the best we could possibly understand it, the bottom part would be painted black, the top part a bright white light. That's heaven. The dark part, he had to put suns in and worlds. That's us. And you can find that in Genesis first page, chapter one. He did not say, let there be abundant water, and it simply was, going, keeping on with the same um, idea. He drew water from space. Space has small molecules of H2O. He drew from the universe. The waters for this planet. No other planet has this. What we these oceans and lakes and rivers. 
And, you know, Moses is his name, and so he, he was, uh, Moses means drawn from water. Of course, that's because he was found in a basket, but in the Nile. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so God created humanity. Then he added a script, as though for a reality television show. The script of the story of the Jewish people. And the day of the Lord, and he prepared it with the scripture. This day was in his mind as the Torah was before he ever started creation. He put it all together in his mind and willed it to be. But there was a process. Man doesn't, he didn't actually take sand of the earth. That is a reference to the elements of the earth. We have over 62 elements of the earth in our bodies. It's part of the construction. But that's a whole other video in and of itself. But I mean, but he, he created mankind. The, okay, so he prepared not only the Torah, but Ezekiel wrote Ezekiel. I mean, that's the best way to look at it. God may have had to use other people, may have had a spirit enter somebody else and say, I'm God, get a stylus, get some parchment, write this down. And you don't say no. But the best way I have been told to look at it is whoever the main character is, Ezekiel, if it's the prophets and they're writing words of God, then a spirit has a lit upon them. They are a man in divine beings. And that's all it is. Man just, we, we first see man in divine beings with Jacob when God speaks to him and changes, renames him Israel. And all he did was, there's, there's Jacob sleeping with his head on a stone and God tells his spirit, his angel, I'm going to rename Jacob today and begin the creation, the form, the formation of my people, Israel, the Jewish people. He'd already begun it with Abram when he named him a Hebrew out of nowhere. Abraham wasn't born a Hebrew. He just came up with it. Just like when in Persia, in the exile, is the first time we see Jew. Has nothing to do with Jew. It ends with E.W. What I'm told from God is that, is, is that it was the dilution of the pure Hebrew blood through intermarriage between the tribes and things during the exile and, and uh, with Gentiles. And he just changed it. And he said he knew it would be a name that would stick in the world. <laughs> I mean, you think of Jew, you think of the Jewish people. You think of Judaism. They go together. It's just, you know, it's like Hebrew. He just... That's the word I want to use. And Hebrew, in Hebrew, is Ivory. That kills me. Abraham the Ivory. I don't know. It just doesn't sound near as majestic. But uh, I don't speak Hebrew, by the way. Nor do I read it. I've been working on it. And you, you can see this, that he had the prophets writing the, the books that they wrote. Because the day of the Lord and the time for it is set up through the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Malachi. You have to put those four together. And it's so easy. When the land blooms again, which began in 1948, after desolation and everything ruined, the ruined cities, and then see a time is coming, Jerusalem has to be rebuilt from certain biblical markers, and it has been. See, your time is coming, I'll make a new covenant with you. Well, that's today. That's how easy it is. All, all God has been saying is, when y'all come back, I'll come back. I'm going to come with a covenant of friendship when David's here. Because when, he's, because when David comes, well, when he's here, God has a reckoning with the shepherds. That's the rabbis. And he dismisses all of them. They're dismissed. And there's lots of reasons for that. I've already dealt with it on other videos. But you never hear it practiced or preached. I mean, not practiced. You, 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 I, I've never seen a rabbi talk about it. They always say, Moshe come, Moshe come. They pray for Moshe, the anointed one, because they believe in a messianic area that's 
is based on verses for antiquity that were never meant to be thought of as actually occurring except by those people because they lived in a different world, completely different world. If a prophecy cannot occur in reality, there's another purpose for it. That is one purpose for religious purposes. And in part, that's why the Spirit of God doesn't answer God in Genesis when he says he's going to create man in his image. It just causes conflict because everybody comes up with something else. And things like that. And, and, and just for religious purposes, for antiquity, the people of antiquity, and, um, and for prophecy. Prophecy is there, but if a prophecy cannot be. Now, I'm not talking about miracles that God did in the Exodus. He specifically, specifically did those things. Although they've been blown out of proportion in ten commandment movies. It doesn't say he parted the water. It says an east wind blew the waters back all night long. And God made the, the, the land dry. And then they crossed up. <coughs> and I guess he let it go when Pharaoh's armies got there. I don't really study the Torah very much. Basically, the prophets in the day of the Lord. I was an atheist for 50 years. I didn't read the Bible for the first time until I was 50. And that's because God said, let's go to the bookstore and get you a Tanakh. And I said, well, what's a Tanakh? <laughs> and there, that's, where I, that's how far back I started. And yet I know all these things. How do I know all these things? God's dictating them to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. I'm the Moshe, I'm the man described in Isaiah 53, the righteous servant, and I'm the prophet like Moses. And Elijah, whose purpose is the same as the purpose of the righteous servant to make the many righteous. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. He's to recounsel the sons to the father and the fathers to the son, and that commandment, that task, Immediately follows the verse, verse 22, be mindful, be mindful of the teachings I gave Moses at Oreb of my laws and rules and commandments for all of Israel. That's the amendment. The new covenant is not new. The first covenant is still there because it keeps repeating, I will be your God, you will be my people. Okay, that's all the backdrop I need. Uh, I've already gone through a half an hour. That's all my camera will record at a time. I had to take a short break. <clears throat> but the new covenant is, it's, that's what it is. That's the amendment. Be mindful. That, what is mindful? Well, <clears throat> it's not strict compliance. Okay, but it's still the teachings that Moses gave to the Israelites that, we, that, that he had to write down first. I mean, that's how you know. I mean, God says, Moses, go tell the Israelites this. And you have a chapter in Leviticus. Okay. But we have it. He didn't just simply go tell. No, it started with, Moses, get a parchment and stylus, write this down. Now, go tell them. Which makes sense. How are you going to remember all that? I couldn't get out of the tent. And then I would poke my head back in and say, what's the first sentence? <laughs> And drawn the ire of God, which you'd never want to do. You really don't. Zechariah, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, chapter 1, just verses 7 through 12. And this is, this is in my book that God dictated, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord. Uh, unpublished. For some reason, Jewish publishers... <laughs> I think it's a little too much and too different from the Judaism they know. Well, the Judaism they know is stuck in antiquity. And that's the problem. There's no day of the Lord in the Messianic era. There's no vindication against the Christians. And yet he, tell, he says in chapter 51 of Isaiah, I'm passing the cup of my wrath from you to those who told you to get down and walked all over your back. Adam and Esau, he's coming from Adam, a Christian country. That's why it's arid land in verse 2, or possibly 3, of chapter 53. Which you'll see when, 
in some of my other videos. I have a video, yeah. Okay, anyway. Verse 7. On the 24th day of the 11th month of the second year of Darius, the month of Shabbat, the word, this word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo. Verse 8. In the night, in the night, I had a vision. I saw a man mounted on a bay horse standing among the myrtles in the deep. And behind him were bay, sorrel, and white horses. Now it says, it says, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. The word of the Lord is his angel, it's the messenger of his words, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. That's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord said to me, but the words that come again, God is in him. God's presence, I didn't finish this, his mind, okay, that's his presence. Well, where's the angel? It's the angel of his presence, it's right there, okay, Holy Spirit. Where's God's spirit? It's all around me. Our spirit fills us. So it's the same thing. Holy Spirit, angel of his presence, and the spirit is the body of that particular angel, who is the angel of the Lord. That enters people and God is in him, uh, and and that's what this chapter is about. It's the answer. It's 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 a story, as much as anything. It's based on something that happened on the ground. I'll I'll get into that, but it's not a vision, and it's not it's it's not likened to a dream. There's purposes behind this, and prophecy is not all of it by any stretch of the imagination. It's for this teaching in the day of the Lord. So there's a man standing in the myrtles. On a horse. He's on a horse and the horse is standing in the myrtles. Zechariah has an angel with him who is his guide in this vision. I mentioned Ezekiel and the, the spirit <clears throat> when he was taken to, to Chalvi in a vision. The deep is like a valley. Zechariah is looking down on filled with myrtle trees. And then an open area below that where there are bay soil and white horses. Verse 9, I ask, what are those, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered, I will let you know what they are. Zechariah is not talking to the angel that is with him, who is clearly not a Lord. The small case Lord, by the way that is with him, who answered, but who never lets him know. He, he just said, I'll tell you basically later, and he, he never does. He is talking to the man standing among the myrtles on a bay horse about the horses in the open area. Again, it's a story with purposes behind it. There's no reason to believe Zechariah didn't go and see a man on a horse and converse with him. And then God was <laughs> all this story around it because he's got a purpose in it. God has a purpose. Yeah. He's going to get it done. A purpose with might prosper in Isaiah 53. First time I read that, I said, how you as God can have a purpose and it only might prosper? And he says, you'll see, it connects you with Elijah. Because if Elijah doesn't accomplish his purpose of clearing the way for the Lord, which is building of the temple, it's Elijah, it's not David. And if he doesn't do it, God says, when I come, I'm coming with utter destruction. As I said, God says, I am my creation. He's not talking about doing it in his power, such as Sodom and Gomorrah. He's saying, he may as well have said, I'm going to raise up armies against you. It'd be the same thing if you don't get his temple built for him to return to suddenly. That's his purpose, and it might prosper. And if it doesn't, if people don't recognize Elijah, which means recognize me to the description of Isaiah 53, then the destruction comes to the land. There's 7 million Israeli Jews right now. 
that should ring a bell, that chimes never forget. He's saying, if this doesn't happen, this, this building of the temple, this announcing that the true Mushiach is here, Mashiach, that the Christians are wrong, that there is no Allah, which is nothing but a plagiarism of the Hebrew Bible. They call themselves a light. They say Abraham is their father. They bring it from Adam and Eve. And they put their own cultural laws, ways, means, mores, philosophies into it in place of God's word as we know it, which is God's word in the Hebrew Bible. So he's talking to the man. Then the man who was standing among the myrtles spoke up and said, These were sent out by the Lord to roam the earth. It's the man in the myrtles that answers the question of Zechariah, not the angel who is with him. Verse 11, And in fact, they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtles, We have roamed the earth and have found all the earth dwelling in tranquility. So what did these horses do in this story? They reported to the angel of the Lord, which is the man on the horse in the myrtles. How is the man on a horse the angel of the Lord? The Spirit of God has entered him, and God is in his spirit. He is a man in divine beings. To the angelic horses, <laughs> the horses who can talk, in the story, they can see the angel of the Lord, but we can't. He's made a spirit. We can't see spirit. Our science, see, we're in a universe within a universe. God's universe was there, and he added all this. this that's, that's when creation really got going for God. And he loves it. Uh, and there's reasons for that. Uh, from the entity that he is, the being that he is, there's a reason he likes to be down here. It's kind of hard to fathom. But uh, that's for in the future. We'll get, get into that more. I need to learn more about it. God is using this man as his visible presence, his rep representation through the angel of his presence, which is what he did with Moses, which is what he's going to do with Moshe, which he is doing with Moshe, which he did with the prophets. Write this down. The man and divine beings. They, they, he, can actually, he can literally speak to you. He can speak through me. He did it to me. I was in the bathroom looking in the mirror. I was going to shave. And, 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 and my head tilts up. His power surrounds me like the cords of power that, that surrounded Ezekiel and pinned him to the ground for almost a year and a half for the punishment of the sins of the house of Israel. Again, Ezekiel's the key to 53. He goes through God's fire refinement of, and you'll find all these words in chapter 53, punishment, wounding, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing, and bruising. Crushing and bruising, being pinned to the ground, do that to you. Maltreatment. Just being pinned to the ground is maltreatment. But the whole time he was teaching Ezekiel, eat this scroll of Ezekiel, how, how to preach to the exiles, how to tell them God's words. He's learning as he's going through, and why? Because Ezekiel said, a spirit entered into me, and I went in bitterness, and in the fury of my spirit, in the hand of God. That's the fire of refinement. He's not happy at all. And, and it's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah, I mean, you, you wouldn't say no. Nobody would say no to God. He didn't have to crush me with cancer to have me offer myself for the guilt and emotion of the Jewish people for unrighteousness. You know, chapter, uh, chapter 53 starts with six verses of the witnesses who are all saying, we're sick, we're sick, and we're suffering. Well, they're sick because, because they feel guilty. They're, they're not doing right. 
And they know if they had followed God's laws, their family would be better, they would be better, their neighbors would be better, they'd be a light to other people, they'd feel good about themselves and said they're sick. That's why he's the righteous servant. I see, I, I see these rabbis preaching, it's the kings from chapter 52 who were startled and silenced. Why? When did they get maltreated, crushed, bruised, wounded, punished? I, I don't know. And it's in quotes. The first six verses are in quotes. And the only book that has that is the Jewish Publication Society that began as a complete new transcription from the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew Bible we have, completely new. It has the quotes. Shabbat.org and all their comments and commentary with Rashi don't have it. And it's important. It makes you know that the first three people talking who have heard our report since they don't use any of those big suffering words because of the quotes, they're included as witnesses that are made righteous. That's what it's all about. And all those words are just for what the man has to go through to become the man of righteousness. So he bears all that suffering and by it, he's not crucified. He makes them righteous. They're not sick anymore. It's, there's no vicarious suffering or anything. It has nothing to do with that. And God tells you in Ezekiel, He tells Ezekiel, you're going to suffer the punishment of the house of Israel and Judah. Really, it's just the punishment corresponding to. But to Ezekiel, what he just did was make him angry again. He's going to make him angry so many times that Ezekiel finally, like Moses, becomes humble. Moses began with a fiery spirit, so angry he killed the man. At the end of his 40 years with God, he is said to be the most humble man on earth. <laughs> That's because of God's fire of refinement. It's not mentioned in the Torah because it was left for me to tell you about it, rabbis. And if you don't want to be dismissed, which means not in right standing, which means you fall into the category of, even though it's not so, but you're in that category, those who do not heed him, do not fear him, do not revere and esteem his name. In other words, he don't pay attention to you. That's all it means. It's not coming after you. Right? <laughs> We're not that important to me. <clears throat> so this, verse 12, Finally, right? Thereupon the angel of the Lord exclaimed, O Lord of hosts, how long will you withhold pardon from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you placed under a curse 70 years ago? That's what the interpretation Rashi is referring to is needed. He didn't even realize he had all this information on the angel of the Lord. And, and it's been taught to me. And, and again, you find it in Isaiah 63, one time. He says, angel of his presence. One time, he says, Holy Spirit. He could have done it in the Torah. When he said, I send my angel before you, he could have said it right there. The angel of my presence, the Holy Spirit. But he did. He didn't want you to pick up on it. Rabbis, Judaism, sages of long ago. It's my proof. Not only do I have a description, and he dictated as a ghostwriter my life, the life of of the righteous servant of God, of Isaiah 53. I have two books, they're both unpublished. But if you want to see how I truly fit these verses, read that book. The first seven chapters, I think, are uh, just life history that focuses in on basically injuries and cancer and uh, showing a man of suffering familiar with disease. And then uh, midway, the chapter, God speaks to an atheist. And from there, I, I relate everything that's been going on for 13 years. He's had me for 13, he had Moses for 40. I'm still not the most humble, but he says he needs a little fire in me still. We got a lot to do. And just, he said, Moses did too. I didn't finish up with him till, yeah, till he was gone. There's always more improvement to be made, which just thrills me to no end, of course. So anyway, He's so funny.
Thereupon, this exclamation, uh, the man on the horse, also referred to as the angel of the Lord who is in him, said these words, God's presence is in the angel of the Lord. So what's it about? Well, you have to go into the following verses from the book of Isaiah regarding the curse. Isaiah 43 and 2. So, this is God. So I profane the holy princesses. I abandoned Jacob to proscription and Israel to mockery. Okay, that's the banish, that's the exile of the Assyrian, the North Kingdom and the South Kingdom. That's Assyrian, Babylonian became Persian. They're not just the Babylonian exiles. All 13 tribes came back, remnants of each tribe. And that's that, that is verified in Ezra and Nehemiah. And, and the profaning of the holy princesses, that's the banishment of Jekinah, Jekinah, and the uh, which gives us the son of Jesse. That's his banishment because of losing the second temple and the, the defeat by Babylon and the, there was three deportations and until they were all finally gone. And in Assyria, Assyria had, had defeated the northern kingdom, deported it to Assyria, and uh, imported Gentiles. That's why when the exiles returned, they all go to Judah. It's not because there's no uh, tribes of the northern kingdom, which would be the major uh, all but two, uh, Benji, the lands of Benjamin are considered Judah because that's where the kings rule from. That's where Jerusalem is in the lands of Benjamin. And Judah is everything beneath it to Egypt. And then God has this. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your folk from the east, will gather you from out of the west. I will say to the north, give back. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. All who are linked to my name, who I have created, formed, and made for my glory. This is God's prophecy that all the tribes of Israel will return from the uh, Assyrian deportations of the tribes east of the river Jordan that were Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and all the tribes of the northern kingdom and the Babylonian deportations of the southern kingdom. It is a prophecy that is specific to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles. And it's fulfilled according to Ezra. Ezra chapter 3 verse 1. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites being settled in their towns, which would be in Judah, they would have had to establish them, these, these northern kingdom tribes, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. Okay, Benjamin and Judah are not the entire people of Israel. They simply aren't. You have to have all of the tribes. That's followed by this. And, and really there's a lot more in Nehemiah and Ezra. All of Israel had returned together to Jerusalem, mindful of the imported Gentiles. 1 Chronicles, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. The first who settled in their towns on their property were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judeites and some of the Benjamites and some of the Ephraimites and some of the Manessahites settled in Jerusalem. Now what do we just list? The largest landowners, the priestly tribe, of course, and little Benjamin, because Jerusalem's there. Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh. Largest tribes, largest lot owners. That's why they're mentioned by name. Didn't mention all twelve of them, all thirteen. And even so, you'd have to say, well, there weren't ten lost tribes, eight, or whatever the number would be. <clears throat> it's just a story, I believe, that originates in the town. Nobody got lost. Nobody got lost. The Mediterranean's right there. Everybody can find an ocean, a sea. Just follow. It. You, you'll find where you came from. And so God's prophecy fulfilled. They came back. You know, it was just a remnant of them, and many of them stayed. Uh, historically, we know, or it said, 
that many many of the uh, the exiles stayed in Syria, Babylon, well, Persia, until it was no longer Persia. <clears throat> and also, for, again, this chapter forty three twenty five. It is I, I who, for my own sake, wipe out your transactions and remember your sins no more. This is God doing something new for the Israelites. Guess what he's doing again? It's not a Messianic era. It's the day of the Lord. What's he doing? He's sending a new covenant. Who with? The angel of his covenant. Who's the messenger? Elijah. What does the messenger do? He takes the covenant and delivers it to the world, to the Jewish people. Why Elijah? The only man specifically taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible and God sends him back? You have to ask yourself, What's that about? Well, other than the fact that God will have taught him everything you can know if you had been taken to heaven, all the information of heaven, which you've been hearing from me in this video and in prior videos, <clears throat> and this, who's going to be able to talk to the angel? Well, how about the man who's been in heaven for thousands of years? Elijah. And he takes that covenant, it's a new covenant, and there's the sin forgiveness. I will forgive your sins and remember them no more, and this will write Torah on your heart, and I will heed it. That is clarified in Malachi 3, and uh, you have the amendment. That's in addition to the first covenant, this sin forgiveness. That's what it is, because God says, you, you'll have Torah on your heart because I'm going to forgive your sins. Well, that doesn't seem to go together. How does that? Because, and Elijah's purpose is, Bring them back to Judaism. Recounsel the families, one member to the other. How are you going to do that? Well, here's an amendment to remind you. My, be mindful of my teachings through Moses. Judaism, bring them back. Make them righteous. Again, same purpose as the righteous servant. If it describes anybody and you want to stay in antiquity, it's not Jesus. It's Elijah. Abraham says, well... Well, Elijah, we don't know if he comes before or after Moshe. So it, it is better that we study Torah and not worry ourselves about things we, we, we cannot understand from, from the prophets. It's easy to understand. If you're the man experiencing it, I'll give him a break. He's right. We'll have to wait till he gets here. Just like this. Now, what's it all about? I'm on, uh, the, the tape's getting short. I have... What can I do here? Okay, this vision of Zechariah and the words of the angel of the Lord through the man standing in the myrtles regarding the curse 70 years ago is made, to Zechariah, is made to make Zechariah think and try to understand why is the angel saying this? From his perspective, the curse was lifted as he was back in Jerusalem with all the tribes preparing to build the second temple. The vision is for Zechariah to find out how and when the curse was lifted. Now, how's God going to avoid that problem again? The description of a man in the day of the Lord. They're going to hear it. They're going to hear it with these videos that God is having me do. He, he wrote this. This is right. Well, it comes from a story that we had, but he had me put three chapters together and delete a bunch, slim it down, and get your camera, get some, get some eggs first. He tell, I, I have no self-will. He directs everything I do from within me, although his presence is without me too. I am the man, the Spirit of God, entered into, lived upon, entered into, and God is in him. And that's how I know all these teachings. That's how I can write the books, because I'm like, okay, we, I know you taught me all that, but what's the first sentence? So give me a few words, and I'll see if I can type the rest. And he said, you just type what I tell you to write. <laughs> okay. He, he's, really, he's got such a far-ranging personality. I mean, he's not just the God of the Torah who is punishing and plaguing and angry. You know, Moses hits a rock instead of speaking to it to give water. And God says, well, that's it, Moses. That's it. Forty years after what he's been through. That's it, Moses. You're not going into the promised land. Go to the mountain and die. That's a little over the top. 
<laughs> he's tough, but he likes to be perceived as tough. He says you needed it back then. You had to sound like, you know, you drop it. <laughs> and, and that's why I will raise up armies against you. And he's looking over and he sees Rome. He sees Greece and he sees Persia. And he's going, they're coming. They'll come again. Once they find out that they have a, a one God and scrolls that God supposedly uh, dictated the Torah. And, and it, it's a beautiful land if you know how to take care of it. I mean, it laid in desolation. You, you should see the pictures of when uh, Mark Twain went there in the early, uh, late 1800s. He wrote down, it's just desolate. <laughs> you know, and now, you know, just Google it and go, go look at everything Israel. It is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Always rank in everything, living conditions, the people, happiness, joy. Everything you can rate a country on, they're always in the top ten. And they had the finest, the finest Air Force in all the Middle East. And their army is ranked second to nobody. But if you combine the armies of all the nations of the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, let, you know, then you got a problem. If they all launch at the same time, you're going to have a destroyed Israel. And there's no reason to believe they won't if they can't do it. God says, you're going to get destroyed. You don't recognize my prophet. Once again, I'm dismissing you, but you can come out of it and help me by straightening out this messianic era with your followers. Learn these books. And these are new teachings. Preach them. Teach them. Tell them how God does and Tell them he's doing it again. Tell them what Isaiah 53 is really about. It's not the people of Israel. How are they going to be God's representative in the day of the Lord? A song. You know who came up with that being a song of Israel? A Christian. A Christian commentator on the Old Testament. A testament that Jesus died saying, hating. It says, and Jesus died hating the laws of Moses. 